So Courtney Madison uh, has been commissioned internationally to create works for permanent collections, including those of the U.S. Embassy and Lindblad Expeditions National Geographic Endurance Ship. Her exhibition history includes solo shows at the Virginia Museum of Contemporary Art, the U.S. Department of Commerce headquarters, and the Lux Art Institute, where she was artist in residence. Curated group exhibitions include Fragile Earth at the Florence Griswold Museum, uh, which will be soon traveling to the Brandywine in Pennsylvania, and We the People at the American Museum of Ceramic Art. In 2020, the United Nations Postal Administration published Madison's work on a stamp to commemorate Earth Day. Born in 1985 and raised in San Francisco, Madison received an interdisciplinary Bachelor of Arts degree in marine ecology and ceramic sculpture from Skidmore College in 2008, and a Master's of Arts degree in environmental studies from Brown University with thesis credit at the Rhode Island School of Design in 2011. Her work has been featured by Smithsonian Magazine, Good Morning America, Oprah Magazine, the BBC, and on the cover of Brown Alumni Magazine. Um, she lives and works in Los Angeles and currently for the coming year in Boston as well. And we're thrilled to just have her here and share her work with all of us. So please join me in welcoming her. I will sit down and let us listen to who we've come to hear. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. Can you hear me all right? Okay, I'll try to project through my mask. Um, I just wanna thank Naomi and all the supporters and everyone who is making this exhibition possible. I'm really thrilled to have Turn the Tide here at the Whaling Museum. And um, I'm just gonna talk about my work and kind of how I came to this intersection of art and science as an artist. Uh, and then we'll leave a little bit of time at the end for questions. Life on Earth really wouldn't be possible without water. Water is what we look for when searching for other planets that might be as hospitable to life as Earth is. As renowned oceanographer and National Geographic Society explorer in residence, Dr. Sylvia Earle says, no water, no life, no blue, no green. She's also fond of saying that without water, we'd have a planet a lot like Mars. The ocean, which covers over 70% of Earth's surface, connects us all, from the deep mesophotic coral reefs of the Philippines to the icy peaks of the Rocky Mountains. And because we're all connected to the ocean, our actions, the carbon dioxide we emit, the materials we waste, the fish we eat, all have an impact on it, no matter where these actions occur. I deeply believe that art can help shape a path towards more wholehearted actions and policies for marine conservation. And so I combine my backgrounds in marine conservation biology and ceramic sculpture to inspire social change, policy change, and translate concepts from environmental science into sculptural installations and objects in an attempt to bring the fragile beauty and fragility of marine life above the surface and into view for people that may not get to experience it otherwise. Coral reefs have really captivated my imagination for as long as I can remember. And I think I'm happiest when the exotic forms and vibrant colors and often venomous appendages of the animals that inhabit a tropical reef kind of dance through the window of my scuba mask as I hover above or behind in this case, I always love encountering strange creatures like this Napoleon wrasse named Wally, who I met in Australia. I love coral reefs for the mysteries they hold and for the tiny plant-like animals that are the faceless architects of some of the world's largest living organisms. And I feel deep connection to Indonesia's coral reefs in particular because I've spent the last few pre-COVID years exploring them, diving in remote parts of Indonesia called Raja Ampat in West Papua, and also Komodo and Alor and Bali. The beauty of these reefs lies in the diversity of their species, I think, and corals, anemones, and other invertebrates are formed by their competition amongst one another for light and other resources that kind of create this beautiful dance. The reefs of Indonesia are more diverse and healthy than almost anywhere else on the planet. And Indonesia lies at the heart of a region called the Coral Triangle, which is famous for having a high biodiversity, a high species concentration, uh, more than any other marine area on Earth. 
So ecologists often refer to it as the Amazon rainforest of the sea for that reason. And these reefs are also very important because they provide food and coastal protection, tourism dollars, and other value to people who directly rely on them. So according to the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network, the value of goods and services provided by coral reefs is estimated at $2.7 trillion per year, including $36 billion for coral reef tourism alone. Corals are so sensitive that the slightest change to the temperature or the chemistry of the seawater that surrounds them can cause widespread devastation through coral bleaching, which occurs when corals become stressed by rising sea temperatures caused by climate change and often exacerbated by El Nino year events. And that obviously results from our fossil fuel use and greenhouse gas emissions that trap the heat within the sun or the sun's heat within our atmosphere. Corals stressed by rising sea temperatures lose the symbiotic algae called zooxanthellae that live inside their tissues, in their skin, um, and photosynthesize to provide an important energy source for the coral. So the coral host, once it loses those algae, essentially begins to starve, and it becomes really susceptible to disease. Corals can recover from bleaching and reverse the, the process by being recolonized by these zooxanthellae, these plants that live inside their skin. But bleaching can also lead to coral death and algal domination and reef erosion, uh, not to mention the gradual destruction of a complex hideout for countless fish and invertebrate species. So it's kind of like a city going bankrupt and letting its buildings fall apart. Another major issue for ocean health is ocean acidification, which occurs when carbon dioxide dissolves into the ocean and forms carbonic acid and releases hydrogen ions that keep the corals and other shell building organisms from precipitating the calcium carbonate that they need to construct their stony skeletons and shells. And that's what builds the reef. Overfishing is another huge issue for coral reef health. Um, 90% of the big predatory fish like tuna, cod, swordfish, and sharks have already been removed from the ocean by commercial fisheries. So having fewer big predatory fish at the top of the food chain can allow their prey to multiply out of control. And it's sort of like wolves and controlling deer populations. But in the ocean, that often isn't even the problem because a lot of those herbivorous prey fish, kind of the deer in that scenario, are being removed at an unsustainable rate too. So on a coral reef, fewer grazers, few of those herbivorous fish means fewer critters grazing on the algae on the reef and clearing spots for baby corals to settle. So it makes it more difficult for the reef to recover if it's damaged. Land-based sources of pollution full of chemicals, sewage, fertilizer, and pesticides from farms and golf courses and other developed areas, both coastal and upstream, pose another major threat to marine life, causing dead zones like this one in the Gulf of Mexico, where excess nutrients cause plankton to grow out of control and die and kind of suck the oxygen out of the water. So it causes um, areas that are hypoxic. They don't have enough oxygen for the fish to survive. And the combination of overfishing and pollution really causes too much algae to grow on reefs, smothering corals and preventing those baby corals from settling and regrowing in damaged areas. So this is a photo I took diving in West Palm Beach a few years ago, and we found out later that it was very close to a sewage outflow, so that was kind of disgusting, but it really looked like a golf course underwater. Everything was green. And then, of course, plastic pollution is another really popular issue right now um, that a lot of people are talking about, but in terms of the giant garbage patches in uh, oceanic gyres with tiny bits of plastic that are degrading and uh, decomposing and in sunlight into these chemical components that can be really harmful. And without our help to eliminate the pressures that we put on reefs, leading researchers predict that nearly 100% of coral reefs will be in a rapid and terminal decline by 2050, like very soon. And they may lose their ecological functionality by the end of the century or potentially sooner. I recently learned that 
we've lost half of the world's coral reefs in my lifetime and I'm 36 years old and they may not survive as long as I do, which is shocking and it makes it very personal, I think for all of us. That all sounds very doom and gloom and this is the most depressing part of the talk, I promise. But there is hope and we may still be able to turn things around. I think it's becoming more and more difficult to be optimistic about the fate of coral reefs in general, but there are certain species that are more resilient to these changes. And so reefs may evolve in ways that we can't completely predict at the moment. And uh, there are certain species that may be able to proliferate where others go extinct. Um, so there was a 2018 report published in the Nature, uh, Nature Climate Change Journal that suggested that climate change selects for more robust heat tolerant coral species that might be able to survive ocean warming within a certain extent. Through my art practice, my goal is to highlight these facts while empowering viewers to feel hopeful and act while we still can. I think art can go beyond showing us scientific evidence or revealing an environmental problem. It can make us care and act to protect. And I think the first time we saw a photograph of Earth from space really sparked this kind of feeling in us, an understanding of our home and our connectedness and how tiny, fragile, and special life is. I think that we protect what we care about and we care about what we know and understand. Art can inspire social change and shape how we understand environmental issues. Art can translate scientific concepts and shape how we understand them. And historically, people really took for granted how interconnected the fields of art and science really are. Leonardo da Vinci is a iconic example of this from the Renaissance where um, he was a polymath and did detailed sketches of human anatomy and nature and um, conducted medical dissections of human subjects. And his illustrations inspired public interest in the human body. And, he innovated research methods that led to him being called the father of modern science, even though we think of him as a famous artist. And one could argue that the creativity and experimentation that sprang from combining art and science during the Renaissance led to many of the major scientific advancements of the time, making this period stand out as a scientific revolution and leading into what historians call the modern age. A more contemporary example is the work of Maya Lin, who I have always looked up to. Uh, this work, Waterline, uh, was created in collaboration with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute to develop a topographic seascape rendering kind of architectural scale, tracing a particular underwater section of the South Atlantic Ocean near Antarctica. Art can also impact our emotions. I love this example with the, the poppies at the Tower of London commemorating World War I victims. And they can, it can also form personal connections and build community. Um, this work was created by lots and lots of volunteers that all got together to create the work. I think art and science are two ways in which community explores or in which humanity explores and explains the world. And artists and scientists actually have a lot in common. They thrive on a shared sense of curiosity about the world and work to form a better understanding of it. And I like this quote from Dr. Mae Jameson, who's the first African-American woman to travel in space. She says, the difference between science and the arts is not that they're different sides of the same coin even, or even different parts of the same continuum, but rather they're manifestations of the same thing. The arts and scientists are avatars of human creativity. Not all artists care about science and vice versa, and that's fine. But both artists and scientists use that creativity to come up with solutions to questions about the world, often developing meticulous techniques to achieve answers to these questions. So with that belief, I have formed a career as an artist and an ocean advocate to bring attention to threats to ocean health. This is a photo of my very first large scale ceramic sculptural coral reef installation called Our Changing Seas, A Coral Reef Story. And this work was the culmination of my master's in environmental studies at Brown, where I combined coursework in marine conservation science, conservation and policy with credits and a co-advisor at the Rhode Island School of Design and the ceramics department. So this one debuted 
in 2011 in the lobby of the Herbert C. Hoover building, which is the headquarters for the Department of Commerce in downtown Washington, DC. And it's also headquarters for NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. As a master's candidate in environmental studies at Brown from 2009 to 2011, I interviewed marine researchers and artists about the potential for art to inspire coral reef conservation. Um, that was the study, the focus of my thesis study. And at the same time, I took ceramics courses at RISD and developed a method of constructing enormous and complex sculptural installations in a studio that I rented in downtown Providence. So I knew going into this project that I wanted to create a masterpiece, something that would be visually stunning and transform a human made environment, but I didn't know what that meant at all, <laughs> or if I could achieve that. Um, so I just got started and I used my interview results to inform the design as I started building and essentially just built as many ceramic corals as I possibly could and decided to figure out how to fit them together later, <laughs> which was interesting. Um, I got permission from the Commerce Department to debut the completed work in their lobby in downtown DC in advance. So it meant that I, I knew from the beginning that I couldn't touch their beautiful historic marble walls. So I had to engineer a steel grid wall support structure to hold the enormous installation that I had planned um, to be about 15 feet tall and 11 feet wide. And so I built this support structure, kind of a counterweighted engineered grid wall and then began attaching pieces to plywood panels on the front of this in my studio. And my poor husband, who at the time was my boyfriend, helped me install nearly everything. And this is probably the only panel of all 24 that he could actually pick up by himself because they were so heavy. Um, but eventually we put it all together. We completed it in my studio for a kind of preview party. Um, in the, I guess it was spring of 2011. And um, it stood about 15 feet tall, 11 feet wide of nearly 1500 pounds of ceramic corals. Um, depicting what I wanted to show was basically a healthy, colorful coral reef at eye level and then transitioning up into that bleached reef kind of in the central section and then up into the eroded algal dominated section at the top. And then the next day, we took it all down and packed it up to ship to Washington, DC. And so Thad and a couple of my friends um, helped me install at the Commerce Building. And I won't go into all the details of Homeland Security with sculpture, but it was fascinating. <laughs> um, and then I did lots of finishing touches with the main pieces installed over the course of a few days. And this is the work when it was completed. So again, at eye level, I really, wanted to celebrate the exotic forms of coral reef flora and fauna in concert with their biological complexity and diversity. And then in the middle, transition up into coral bleaching to represent climate change, and then further up into that algae smothered reef to represent the effects of overfishing and nutrient pollution. And those were kind of in line with the major threats that NOAA National Oceanic Society um, was addressing at the time in terms of the threats to reef. So I was really aiming to influence public and political support for reef conservation through the work. And the administrator of NOAA at the time, Dr. Jane Libchenko, ended up being a wonderful advocate for this work. And she's now Biden's uh, deputy director for climate and the environment at the White House. Um, so she's working on lots of relevant issues to this day, but she's been an uh, inspiration for some of my other work, which I'll show you coming up. Um, and she was able to speak at the opening reception also. And after that debut exhibition, we moved it to the headquarters for the Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, which publishes Science Magazine. Um, and it's also in downtown Washington, DC. So this work is, installed there today. It's on a long-term extended loan at AAAS. And if you're ever in DC, I believe they're open weekdays if you ever want to go visit. And since that time, about 12 years ago, my uh, Art Changing Seas series has grown and changed a lot. And last year, I completed my seventh work in the series for a new hotel in Oceanside, California, near San Diego. 
called the Seabird Resort. And here's a detail shot of, this is our Changing Seas 7. <laughs> the year 2014 is when I really began to focus my designs on elevating corals off the reef with sort of anti-gravity swirling installation designs. And my goal with this series, the Our Changing Seas series, is to inspire awareness and policy change for reef conservation and celebrate the exotic beauty of coral reefs while highlighting the human-caused threats that they face. And this work here is called Our Changing Seas 3. It debuted in 2014 at the Tang Museum at Skidmore College, my alma mater for an invitational alumni exhibition back then. This is me standing in front of it for scale. I feel like this is very helpful because most of my work is so big, it's hard to tell. Um, but essentially, it explores the rapid transition that corals throughout the tropics and subtropics are making from healthy, colorful, and diverse to sickened and bleached as a result of human-caused climate change, which is putting coral reefs into the proverbial eye of the storm. And at its heart, this work really celebrates my favorite aesthetic aspect of a healthy, diverse, colorful coral reef. But by bleaching white, I think it's really powerful because corals offer us a really stark visualization of climate change that is often difficult for us to see and understand firsthand outside of seeing scary news uh, videos of floods and wildfires. Um, I think corals offer a gentler and more kind of emotionally impactful way to see warming oceans that I find really powerful. And in this design, healthy corals are surrounded by these sterile white skeletons of bleached corals, kind of swirling like the rotating winds of a cyclone. And as I mentioned before, it's possible for corals to recover from bleaching. And if the stressor, the temperature goes back to normal quickly enough, corals can actually regain their health and those photosynthetic algae that live in their tissues. To, be, to continue growing and uh, repopulating the reef. So I think viewers can really interpret this work either optimistically or pessimistically, swirling inward or outward. And Our Changing Seas 3 has toured around the country a bit and I'm really thrilled at how people of all ages respond to it. So uh, it's been really fun to show it to different age groups of students as well. And this is at the Virginia Museum of Contemporary Art, where I had a solo show in 2016. This is the sketch I created for Our Changing Seas 3 as I began building. Today, this is a pretty rough sketch compared to what I do now. I'm much more precise that I plan everything in advance. Um, I learned a lot from creating that first Our Changing Seas work in the Commerce Department. I realized that building a million corals and fitting them in later wasn't the best plan. So now I measure everything out very carefully. And I'll show you a bit about my process through this next project. This is the largest work I've done yet. It's called Confluence, Our Changing Seas 5. And here's another shot with me sitting beneath it that shows the scale. It's absolutely enormous. <laughs> um, it's about 28 feet high, in addition to the marble plinth below it, and about 18 feet wide. And we installed it in October 2018 as part of the permanent collection of the U.S. Embassy in Jakarta, Indonesia. And it was commissioned by the U.S. Department of State's Office of Art and Embassies, curated by Virginia Shore and Claire D'Alba. My design and building process has evolved a lot in the past decade, but it always starts with a hand-drawn sketch. And for this example, this is the sketch I did for Confluence after I loaded it into Photoshop and superimposed it over the architectural rendering from the embassy contractor team. And from this sketch, I made an installation map with really precise measurements so that the work looks very organic, but it actually has very precise measurements for it where every single piece of hardware is going to attach to the wall before I ever start building. So it really is a big three-dimensional puzzle. And the horizontal lines on this map correspond to white lines that I put on the floor of my studio in Los Angeles that you can see here. So once I had that grid kind of laid out, I cut out paper footprints for each of the pieces in my sketch and numbered each one so I could keep track of everything. And the floor of my studio was only big enough to create and lay out half of the design at once. 
So I had to create it in two phases of building. I started from the middle out, kind of that eye of the storm outwards. So I really wanted to convey a sense of swirling, floating motion in this work. And it was important to start from the center and then have branches and different tentacles and other appendages kind of swirling with the current around in that um, spiral form. And in this case, the work was comprised of 404 individual pieces that were all numbered and part of the swirl. And in the ocean, individual coral polyps precipitate calcium carbonate from seawater to form stony skeletons that over time grow atop one another to compose the vast complex structures we know as reefs. So I often say that I enjoy feeling like a coral, kind of quietly and methodically constructing these large, delicate, stony ecosystems. I construct the main base pieces by coil building hollow forms from a gritty, bulky stoneware clay. And then I handcraft each branch and mound and texture using simple tools like chopsticks and paintbrushes to sculpt and texture each piece by hand. And I often sit there for hours poking thousands of holes to mimic the repetitive growth of coral colonies. So this is a sped up video of chopsticking. <laughs> Recently, I've also started sketching onto the paper footprints on the floor that I want. So I know what I want each piece to look like before I begin building it. And it's a way to kind of make my process more efficient. Uh, so I don't have to keep referencing my original sketch. After each piece has had time to dry completely, I fire them in my electric kilns. Um, it feels essential that the medium of my work be ceramic for this coral sculptural work, since calcium carbonate happens to be both the compound that corals precipitate that I mentioned to form their stony skeletons, but it's also a common glaze ingredient. And it almost goes without saying that brittle porcelain anemone tentacles and coral branches break easily if they're improperly handled. And that's very similar to the delicate bodies of living reef organisms. So they really have that material in common. And that shared fragility is fundamental to the message of my work. Individual pieces are finished and fired using a color palette of glazes that I've developed to reflect the vibrant tones and textures of healthy marine and vertebrate communities, often juxtaposed against white glazes to emphasize that stark contrast of coral bleaching. So this is a progress shot of glazing with my puppy watching and waiting for treats. <laughs> and then after final measurements, everything's ready to be packed. So I, upon glazing and firing, I reassemble everything um, to make sure everything fits together on my big floor map. And then I'll be able to have um, art packers come in. And uh, this work in particular took me about a year to complete. So it was a real labor of love. And I, my mom, who's here today, helped me do some glazing, my husband, I had a friend help me, but it was definitely a huge uh, undertaking and something that I would love to do again, but it definitely took a lot of energy. Um, we had an amazing fine art handling company come and as you can imagine, packing and shipping fragile ceramic sculpture like this is quite a challenge on its own. So I love the process of art handling and packing that um, we've been able to devise a great strategy to ship my work overseas. And for the embassy project, we had a great team of art handlers who helped install the work with me kind of overseeing and participating over the course of about five days. And I love the technical part of the process too. We had tandem scissor lifts, which was very exciting. Um, and it was pretty intense and complicated, but um, a lot of fun and a great space. It was also kind of funny because people kept coming up from the cafeteria on the second floor and talking to us on the scissor lifts from the catwalk. So a little bit distracting as well. And here's a detail shot of the finished work. I really wanted viewers to be drawn in by the diversity and detail in the work and for them to feel the way I do when I'm hovering over a healthy coral reef in the wild and become curious to learn more about how reefs are important to all of us as individuals. This work is Our Changing Seas 4. I completed this one in 2019 as a private commission for a collector. And I started working on it 
back in 2016. This one took me quite a while to finish, but I started working on it at my former studio in Denver, Colorado, and then completed it while doing a artist residency at the Lux Art Institute, which is now part of the Institute for Contemporary Art in San Diego uh, in early 2019. And that'll be relevant as I show you more of the process. Um, the design process for this work was slightly more sophisticated in some ways. I, Since I had so much time to complete this one, I really um, discovered some new techniques that are very helpful. So. I, this is my hand-drawn sketch that I created for this work to design it. And then I began building on the floor of my former studio in Denver. And as you can see, I like to work big. I hope that the idea of one small person creating such huge intricately detailed sculptural installations causes viewers to kind of wonder why I do that and to realize just how important reefs are to me and hopefully become curious enough to learn more about how the ocean is important to them. And I kind of mentioned pre previously that I enjoy feeling like a coral, um, kind of quietly creating these stony structures that can change an ecosystem. And once the work was constructed and bisque fired for this project, I laid it all out to plan my glazing patterns. And Thad was still helping me 12 years later. <laughs> um, and then fast forward a bit to moving to my studio in Los Angeles in 2019, uh, where the main parts of the new work were installed on the gallery wall. So I was able to take a photo of the kind of core pieces of this installation in place. And then once I had a photo of those pieces, I could put it into Photoshop and superimpose it over my original sketch to kind of figure out which branching pieces and peripheral pieces were missing and then create the rest from there. So I actually put up tracing paper on the wall around the piece and sketched the surrounding branches in full scale. Um, since this time, I've actually started projecting my sketch onto the wall also, which helps a lot. And here's a detail shot of the finished work with the remaining pieces installed. And here's another one. There's an additional 54 white branches and 350 little trailing por porcelain pieces that I created around that core group of work. And this is the one that the United Nations Postal Administration featured on a stamp to commemorate Earth Day. So I was really excited when that happened. It was the 50th anniversary in 2020. And now I'll show you some other work that I've done aside from my Art Changing Seas series that might look a little bit more familiar from the Turn the Tide exhibition upstairs. Um, I'm really thrilled to have this work, uh, Malum Geminus, here at the Whaling Museum because this is another one I completed in 2019, and um, I feel like it's a fun new direction that is a little bit more ominous, and um, I'm excited to explore these themes a little bit more. But the title, Malum Geminus, is an homage to Dr. Jane Libchenko, who was the administrator of NOAA when I was in grad school. In 2009, uh, when she was at the Copenhagen Climate Summit, she made a speech and said that uh, ocean acidification is the equally evil twin of climate change when it comes to impacts on the coral reef crisis and conservation. And uh, the fractal inspired design of bleaching corals branches horizontally in this book matched pattern kind of across the gallery wall. I tried to create porcelain clusters of gelatinous polyps and um, objects that appear to have had their supportive skeletons kind of dissolved in acidic seawater, living among these skeletal forms that are reminiscent of another quote from Dr. Jen Lubchenko, which is that ocean acidification is like osteoporosis of the sea. So I found that really powerful and was inspired by creating these kind of skeletal coral forms. This is a gallery shot during the Fragile Earth Exhibition at the Florence Griswold Museum that Naomi mentioned. And hopefully you've already had a chance to see it here in the gallery, but uh, this fall it'll be rejoining a touring exhibition of Fragile Earth at the Brandywine River Museum um, in Pennsylvania uh, from September through early January, 2023. And here's a shot of me building Malum Geminos and some other work from that exhibition in my LA studio. So again, I was building on the floor with the tracing paper. This is a detail shot of a new work I completed last summer called Revolve, 
which I installed in the seminar room of the new environmental studies building at Wofford College, which is a liberal arts school in Spartanburg, South Carolina. And it's composed of 250 individual ceramic corals and enemies and sponges swirling in a colorful vortex with like a peripheral um, selection of bleached white corals kind of around the edges. And I hope that when students are spacing out and staring at it during class that they'll come up with all sorts of creative ways to fight climate change and protect the ocean. This is another work I completed in time for Fragile Earth in 2019. This is called Texture Study, and it's about five by five feet and up to 22 inches off the wall. So it's very three dimensional. My work explores a number of different ecological shifts that are occurring in coral reefs today. So it's fun for me to experiment with creative and kind of unexpected ways to visualize these issues. So in addition to coral bleaching, another shift that my work explores is the homogenization of species as climate change and other forms of human caused habitat destruction are causing more resilient species to take over and become in, invasive in some places. So this texture study work is kind of an experiment to depict one type of tube sponge in kind of a fantasy world swirling outward and filling a geometric space. And while tube sponges aren't necessarily expected to become invasive in reality, uh, this work and a potential series that I may create kind of inspired by this idea um, will be kind of monochromatic vignettes of what the seafloor could look like in this post mass extinction future. In March 2020, just before everything shut down for the pandemic, like days before, <laughs> I flew to a shipyard in northern Norway. Uh, to install this work on the reception area of Lindblad Expedition's National Geographic Endurance Polar Expedition Vessel. Um, and it was part of a permanent ship-based exhibition called Change, which is curated by an artist named Zaria Foreman, who has actually, I've heard, exhibited her work in this museum in the past as well. So that's kind of another cool climate art connection. In this one, uh, I was really inspired to learn about all the really colorful and beautifully intricate anemone and echinoderm communities that live on the seafloor under the ice in Svalbard in Northern Norway and kind of the Arctic Circle. So I love um, being able to experiment with kind of less tropical invertebrate communities as well. Um, and these are represented in sort of idealized vignettes, a pair of mirror image vignettes of the seafloor ecosystem. This work, Aqueduct, may look familiar. This is a rendition uh, that I originally installed in um, the solo show that I had at the Virginia Museum of Contemporary Art in 2016. And a different rendition of it is installed in the gallery upstairs here. It's a playful yet ominous exploration of sea level rise and species migrations caused by climate change with hundreds of porcelain and stoneware corals and anemones and sponges and other marine invertebrates spilling into the gallery from a hand carved porcelain air duct register. And this work really explores in kind of a playful way what might happen when climate change causes tropical sea creatures to migrate away from the poles due to temperature changes and potentially invade terrestrial spaces as seawater rises and sea levels rise and coastal communities. And kind of begging another question too, will we act urgently to halt climate change and keep the ocean in its place or will we allow the sea to consume us? Another series that's included here in Turn the Tide is my fossil fuel series. And that's inspired by the impacts of fossil fuel use on climate change and coral bleaching. All of my work is free form, hand sculpted with no mold. So these works are also completely ceramic, stoneware and porcelain. And I'll tell you about the other largest work I've completed. It's actually also in Indonesia and was completed in 2018. It's a community-based project that I designed and oversaw, and it was commissioned by a nonprofit organization called the Coral Triangle Center or CTC. The CTC invited me to design this work back in 2016 for the new Center for Marine Conservation in Sanur, Bali, which serves as an educational center for local and tourist visitors. So we formed a team of over 300 Indonesian artists, 
artisans and local volunteers to create over 2000 ceramic pieces um, inspired by different coral forms and created for this installation. So this is during a workshop called Anemone Day. We held a series of workshops over the course of about a year and a half to create all the work for this project. It was a lot of fun. And I'm really proud to have been a part of this project. And I ended up visiting Bali five times between 2016 and 2018 to lead workshops and select glazes and work with our core team of artists to plan the workshops that would be necessary to produce all the work for this project. And I was also able to work with the architect and contractors to figure out the mechanics of the installation. And over a year, probably a year and a half later, um, after all these workshops and weekly Skype calls, Zoom wasn't a thing back then yet. <laughs> um, it took about 12 full days to install the pieces with a team of myself and our lead local artists and a few other key team members from the project. The installation process was really labor intensive and we ended up installing all of these 2000 pieces onto a masonry wall. And I'm not sure how many of you have tried to permanently attach fragile ceramic to a stuccoed brick wall, but it takes forever. So it was quite labor intensive and um, exciting for everyone to be involved. So it was great to be able to involve so many community members. We finished it in late September, 2018 just in time for the Our Ocean Conference in Bali, where a lot of policymakers come to discuss ocean conservation issues. So this is a panorama photographic image that they created of the entire installation. It's really difficult to photograph because it's about 61 feet long total and about eight feet high. And the title is called Semesta Terumbu Karang, which means coral universe in the Indonesian language. Here's a detail shot of the left side and of the right. And then there's this central bullseye of the design. Um, the coral triangle region is comprised of six countries. So I kind of symbolized the six different swirls as those six different countries. And then ecologists often call the coral triangle the bullseye of biodiversity in the ocean. So we wanted to incorporate that concept as well. And the US ambassador to Indonesia at the time, Joseph Donovan, considered the work a form of cultural diplomacy uh, to highlight how the US and Indonesia can work together to conserve coral reefs. So during the conference, we ended up doing a press conference with CNN Indonesia and other outlets about the unveiling and the meaning of the work and the story behind it. And then in October 2019, about a year later, I was invited by the State Department to return to Indonesia and do a nine day artist exchange hosted by the US Embassy in Jakarta and the consulate in Surabaya, which is another big city. Um, and we traveled around Indonesia doing workshops in high schools and colleges. We did workshops very similar to what we did here over the weekend um, and used air dry clay and acrylic paints to create these really sweet little pieces over the course of a few hours during these workshops. And then each student was able to take their piece home. And it was really meaningful to have these students creating pieces that were inspired by the critters that live in their own backyards. And many of them had never seen them before. So it was a wonderful way to start conversations about that. This is another shot of those workshops in progress. And I'll close with one last project. I also work with an amazing nonprofit organization based in Northern California called Mission Blue which was founded by that famous oceanographer and National Geographic Society explorer in residence who I mentioned at the beginning named Dr. Sylvia Earle. She won the TED prize in 2009. And when you win the TED prize, you get to make a wish um, that you try to make come true with the prize. So in response, she said, I wish you would use all means at your disposal, films, the web, expeditions, new submarines, a campaign, to ignite public support for a network of global marine protected areas, hope spots large enough to save and restore the ocean, the blue heart of the planet. So I took this idea to heart and use all skills at my disposal to make a difference. And to kind of uh, support that idea, I created dozens of these hope spot sculptural works to support the organization and inspire people to have hope that there are still healthy, diverse, ecosystems left on earth that are possible to protect and are so worth saving. So this one represents the coral triangle. 
not all hope spots in cor are in coral reef regions, just some of my favorites. Um, so this one is a non-coral one, which is up in the gallery here called the Charlie Gibbs Fracture Zone. Um, and that is a deep sea area that lies along a prominent interruption of the mid-Atlantic ridge between the Azores and Iceland. And this is the Micronesian Islands, which is a tropical Pacific region that's very special. It includes the island nations of Palau, also Guam, the territory, and Kiribati and the Marshall Islands. And in my interpretation, these hope spots are really idealized representations, vignettes that are representative of particular ecosystems that have been deemed especially vibrant often particularly threatened and in need of special protection to protect the health of the ocean as a whole. So I'm really thrilled that this work will potentially be acquired by the Whaling Museum as well. Um, and I think the idea that we should all do what we can uniquely do to protect and restore the ocean is a powerful one. For me, it's about raising awareness and inspiring action by visualizing climate change through my work. And I still feel like I'm just getting started. So I hope that this work will continue to grow and change and inspire greater levels of public support for ocean conservation. And I hope it inspires you to think about what you can uniquely do to contribute to that as well. So thank you so much. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, I have a mic here. If we have any questions from the audience, we've got about 10 minutes to chat with our artists. Anyone? Hello. Thank you for such a terrific presentation. You mentioned that all of the forms are actually free formed. You don't, you don't use mold for any of these pieces. Correct. Yes. I hand build everything. So um, I build most of my work hollow with coils of clay that I build concentrically and then I cl close them up and then finish them with different branches and things that are solid that I sculpt and attach. So, Extraordinary. And the, the piece upstairs, is that a perfect mirror image? And how were you able to replicate both sides? That's a good question. Um, I'd like you to think it's a perfect mirror image, <laughs> but it's very difficult to create perfectly symmetrical things out of mud, as I mentioned in the gallery. I think um, the way I did it was uh, I created a design that was very abstract, kind of a fractal pattern, and then I, I mirrored it on Photoshop and then created it full scale on the floor of my studio using tracing paper, and I actually sketched it full scale. Once I had that, that drawing, I was able to use the pieces as templates to create the work. And I would create the mirror image pieces at the same time to make sure they matched one another. Right, thank you for that. Thanks. Questions? Phoebe, do we have any questions back there from the... Great. Hi, Courtney. So I, my name's Heather. I teach at the, I teach ceramics full time at the largest high school in Massachusetts. And, um, you know, your work in Indonesia with all those little classes that you had, what sticks with you the most in your interactions with those students that you had in Indonesia? First off, thank you for what you do. That's wonderful. I discovered ceramics in high school and that really changed my life. So that's very important work. Um, mm -hmm. I think the work in Indonesia was wonderful because as I mentioned, it was working with young people who have the most exquisite coral reefs on earth in their own backyards. And many of them had never put their faces underwater and looked at them before. So being able to show them that, but then also learn from them what that means to them and and kind of learn about what the ocean means to them in their lives was really impactful in a way that made me appreciate how people rely directly on the reef for survival and for all these resources. And then perhaps don't appreciate the beauty and the fragility of them in the same way that I do. So it was a really interesting cross-pollination. That's really interesting. Thank you so much. Thanks.
Anyone else? Oh, thanks. I was just curious how you did um, affix the ceramics to the stucco. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that was really difficult. Yes. Well, the um, individual pieces had sockets that were built into the back, uh, and that's a technique I use for most of my wall relief work. But in this case, we were doing a permanent installation, and so uh, we needed to use epoxy to attach the pieces to bolt heads that were sticking out of the stuccoed masonry wall. So not only is it difficult to drill into brick and attach an anchor and get the hardware to hold securely, um, but then we also were using epoxy and kind of gluing everything on, and um, it was just a process. <laughs> Deep learning curve. Yeah. Um, I, thank you for your your wonderful presentation, and just to, it's fabulous to see your work. Um, I was wondering um, when you were talking about the new species that you discovered under the um, the cold. Um, part of the world? Are there other parts of the world that you want to explore and find out more about? Yes, definitely. I think I fell in love with coral reefs as a muse for my work very early on, and I've really delved into that very deeply, and I am excited to consider exploring other ecosystems. I think uh, kelp forests in particular are really beautiful, and there's a lot of motion in the way that the algae kind of swirl in the currents and the different species that rely on them, sea urchins and all kinds of different invertebrates that I love. So um, yeah, definitely. I think it would be fun to branch out a little bit and explore different ecosystems. Anyone else? So well, I have uh, one final question here. Can you share with us what's coming next? I know you have some exciting commissions around the corner. Sure, yes. Um, I have a couple private commissions and some projects um, on the horizon, but one exciting one that has sort of a connection to the Whaling Museum is with the new US ambassador to China, Nick Burns. Um, he and his wife were able to visit the gallery in November and see my work, and they ended up uh, requesting to have a piece of my work included in a long-term exhibition that'll be in their residence in Beijing through the art and embassies program that I worked with to do the Jakarta project. So um, that was a really fun connection that was relevant to this place. But essentially it's going to be, it won't be a wall relief. It's, uh, I am just completing it right now, um, but it's a freestanding pillar. It's a beetle kill pine log that I found when I was living in Colorado. And I'm using it, I, I kind of bleached it white and I am using it vertically as sort of a um, dock piling looking form, and then I'm encrusting it in these porcelain corals and anemones and different bleached white um, creep, uh, marine invertebrates that are implying um, that impact from climate change. So that work is going to be called Spectre. Fantastic. Well, I know we'll all look forward to seeing it when it premieres. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out this evening and joining us and to once again, thank Courtney for sharing her work with us tonight. Thank you so much.